Mental Liberation, an Iron March publication, Chapter 3, Total Revolution. The Failed Approaches of the Past Our goal is to restore the worldview of truth, a worldview that is based on something eternal, unchanging. However, we are living in the material world which is constantly undergoing change, and contrary to the progressivist logic of our enemies, that change is leading us down a spiral to our own destruction. From what was said in previously in this manual, it should be now evident how the world around us is constantly regressing, following a self-destructive pattern. And like in medicine, when the disease takes a more and more aggressive form that threatens the life of the patient, more aggressive cures are considered. Flesh-eating bacteria requires amputation, removing cancerous tumors requires cutting some of the healthy tissue away. The logical progression of our struggle is to step up our game whenever societal decay progresses further. Therefore, relying on tactics of yesteryear is all but assuring failure and ultimately defeat. That is why it is important to realize when the time for certain methods has long since passed. What presented hope yesterday is a lost opportunity today, and we have to plan for the next time we are presented with hope. There are many out there who are engaged in some half-hearted struggle against the system which is at best misguided and at worst simply people playing pretend. They don't want victory. They are enjoying this game where they jokingly poke the system, claiming to be doing real damage to it while the system calmly ignores them or swats them away with great ease, something they enjoy all the more as it creates a false validation of their actions to others around them, fueling their fantasy. There are organizations out there who are attempting to fit into mainstream politics. They try to win by playing the system's game and by its rules, blind to the rules having been purposely designed against them. Hitler and the NSDAP managed, managed it because they were a novelty and they were facing a weak enemy, the system in its, fans, in its infancy. That opportunity is long since gone and the system will not allow something like that to ever happen again, so it is impossible for an openly fascist slash Nazi group or even a group that only believes in a few select elements that are contrary to the system dogma to ever enter mainstream politics. The only exception to this is that we can think the only exception to this that we can think of is Golden Dawn in Greece. However, they use their presence in Parliament to openly mock its impot impotency. They are in the game to mock the game. Their real efforts are directed elsewhere. Is that right? Golden Dawn is in the Parliament of Greece. Some organizations decided that they could do well if they toned down their message, make compromises on their rhetoric and official stances, all to make themselves presentable and respectable to the system and the masses that blindly accept whatever the system tells them is presentable and respectable, and those de definition definitions are changing fast as each new stage of the disease destroys what birthed it. Yesterday's revolutionaries, quote-unquote, of progress becoming today's regressive reactionaries. In the end, this approach always leads to its practitioners looking like pathetic, weak, and impotent fools. As, and so they are. Even with toned-down rhetoric, the system knows what you really are trying to say, and it will put you on the spot, forcing you to deny your association with the extreme forms of your views, forcing you to backpedal and compromise, forcing you to forever be on the defensive. Look to the British National Party as a prime example, too cowardly to even call itself nationalist. They had been forced by the system to change their program to allow non-whites into the party, and they are still regarded as evil, but not as a real threat. Any kind of presentability and respectability approach that could have worked at some point was the one practiced by George Lincoln Rockwell and his American Nazi party. But note the name. They did not compromise on the message, on what they are. They did not hide. Their presentability and respectability was that of defenders of the older age when USA was in a transitionary stage to the new standards of presentability and respectability that would dominate onward from the 60s, ones more appropriate for the new stage of the disease. That time has likewise passed, and one will not be able to appeal to anyone in this day and age with respectability standards of the past, 
whereas modern standards demand you actually being in the game or else the system will see through you. Commander Rockwell wore a suit and was surrounded by men in party uniforms. He could pull that off, but only in that particular juncture of U.S. history. Wearing a suit today will not impress anyone unless you can back it up with system credentials that are valid in this day and age, but most of the people who pursue this approach are ones that want to make it with expired credentials. Your outward presentability means nothing if you are an evil bigot stuck in 1950s, less than nothing if you are openly fascist. However, some groups mistake outward appearance for open conviction. Look at the National Socialist Movement, NSM, in USA. They are seemingly open and upfront about their views and even wear uniforms. Yet should one compare pictures of Rockwell's ANP and the NSM, it will become painfully self-evident how the latter are not even remotely in the same league with the former. When the ANP used uniforms, it had shock value as, as, as the Second World War was still a fresh event and this kind of resurfacing of Nazi apparel almost immediately after the war was like a statement that the Nazis haven't been beaten at all. Moreover, they are now right in your backyard. This was a powerful symbol, but more importantly, there was real conviction beneath the uniforms. The ANP were trained for combat and practiced great discipline to avoid provocations and stand firm in the face of the enemy. Moreover, they projected strength and superiority over their enemies, the only real kind of presentability and respectability that matter. Compare that with the NSM. They look goofy. They look out, they look out of place. They are a rabble in both appearance and behavior, easily provoked and gladly engaging in shouting matches with the opposition. They project neither strength nor superiority. They lack any kind of real discipline, all things painfully evident to everyone around. The shock value of the uniform has long since passed and even been diminished further by modern mass culture, which includes role-playing as Nazis at certain events. And that is what the NSM are doing. They are role-playing. They wear the uniform, but there is little to no substance underneath. Some of them are outright obese, proving lack of training and discipline. Their activism boils down to public appearances like marches, which are no better than role-playing. They put on the uniform just for this special occasion where they walk around and feel good about themselves without having done anything at all, and later they will pat each other on the back. The struggle is not a 9-to-5 job, though let's be honest, they likely spend far less than 8 hours doing even their pretend brand of activism. From which you return, take off the uniform and be a good system slave the rest of the day. And on the subject of marches, these have become a crutch of dying and hopeless movements and organizations, done only to prove to the world that, yes, we are still around, irrelevant and destined for inevitable obscurity, but still around, for a little while longer. A march only has power to it if it's done for a specific reason, that is to say that each march must have its own unique character to be a real march and not just people walking in the same direction. A march devoid of meaning is just a pointless mass with no destination other than from point A to point B. Marches are not recruitments, recruitment tools in and of themselves if the people don't see a real message and substance in it beyond official group slogans and party programs. Marches done to commemorate some date are pointless unless there is a real link present, unless it becomes more than just about the date itself. Look at the yearly Russian march. With each passing year, it loses its meaning and essence becoming nothing more than a crutch for its organizers who are facing obscurity. Think of it this way. The more often a group marches and the less distinction there is between the marches, the more likely it is that this group has no substance to it. A march that has meaning is one that marches towards that meaning. It can be an act of defiance. It can be done in memory of the fallen. It can be a threat and a promise. It can become the manifestation of fate's inevitable approach, a vision of destiny itself. That is the sort of march that will make the system once again experience that primal fear that it had experienced once before already. What won't make the system afraid, however, is whining. It won't make it, or its slaves, feel bad for you either, yet some people took on this tactic of apparent weakness and victimhood in an effort to harvest the forces that the system uses to protect its most precious assets, and let's be clear here. It does not regard people as human beings. It doesn't protect minorities or whoever else out of pity. It simply protects its assets. While the slave masses are the ones that are meant to do the same out of pity, or out of some humanist notion of being a good person to your fellow man, or some good Samaritan sense of a dutiful citizen. 
Let us make this point again. The system wrote the rules. The rules are purposely aligned against you. Trying to circumvent those rules will not fool it or its slaves. Multiculturalism equals white genocide. Africa for Africans, Asia for Asians, white countries for everyone. These are whining, sniveling, and self-deprecating moans of those who admit defeat and plead with their victor. It is the equivalent of saying, but this isn't fair. Can't you cut me some slack? What kind of a thing is that to say to the enemy whose explicit purpose was to come and kill you? There is no room for complaining in a struggle, and complaining to the enemy is admitting defeat. How many fist fights have you seen being won by the guy who screamed, Why are you hitting me so hard? We already went over how strength and superiority are the only credible kinds of respectability and presentability, whereas these slogans do nothing but conjure images of a pathetic weakling. And what did these people hope to accomplish with these slogans, or rather signals of defeat? They hoped to awaken the masses, to help arise that mythical silent majority which some have been awaiting for decades now. It's the approach of the mass movement or a massive upheaval, to either recruit the masses into toppling the government or provoking some euphoric awakening that would result in the same. People who believe in this approach are the ones who themselves have not yet achieved mental liberation, otherwise they'd know exactly how hopelessly entangled the masses are. They are not on the outside looking in and figure the people around them to be exactly like them. However, if that person can't achieve mental liberation, then it is he who is like the rest of them. We are too far down the rabbit hole now to hope awaken, to hope awaken them wide masses like Hitler once did in Germany. Moreover, the conditions were different, a different time and a different place. Today the system is firmly everywhere and in nearly everyone's head. You can't hope to achieve a mass awakening without first taking down the system itself, yet this approach hinges on trying to take down the system by means of mass awakening. However, the mass approach would fail even if its advocates could assemble some kind of mass, simply because they don't know where, they, where to direct it. These people most often don't even know how to direct their own actions, which is evident in the various failed lone wolves, which is not to say that the lone wolf approach isn't a realistic one. It simply goes to show how most of the people who went down this path didn't know that they were doing, didn't know what they were doing and what for. Their actions were spontaneous and largely unplanned as they mostly focus on what action they want to take in and of itself but don't think about or prepare escape routes and contingencies in case of what surprising circumstances in case of surprising circumstances but most importantly they don't know what their actions accomplish which is most often a grand total of nothing. They appear in a short-lived and ill-conceived blaze of glory that barely registers on the system's radar. These failed wolves go after big, flashy, obvious, and largely irrelevant but symbolic targets which can be replaced with ease. This likewise betrays lack of mental liberation as they place value in things that the system makes them place value in. Shooting the president of a given country would be an example of a pointless action that achieves nothing as a president is a simple and easy cog to replace in the system's mechanism. Certain singular exceptions exist, but USA certainly isn't one of them, and it won't even skip a beat. Such is the case of shooting Ronald Reagan, whereas the assassination of J.F. Kennedy was most likely done by the system itself as he was a defective cog that didn't fit in with its plans. The examples of successful and true lone wolves come from Timothy McVeigh and Anders Breivik. Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bom uh, bomber, and Anders Breivik, the... Uh, Norwegian mass, mass shooter who had thought out every step of their plan and executed them flawlessly attacking the system system where it truly hurts. McVeigh struck it at a nest of system goons and managers in the forms of the Social Security Administration, the United States Secret Service, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Breivik did a diversionary attack on the Oslo government quarter and from there proceeded to the Utaya Island, the location of the Norwegian Workers' Youth League summer camp, attacking the future hopefuls of the system that it was grooming to carry on in maintaining the machinery that pumps poison throughout society. 
The lone wolf approach is only good if you have the kind of skills, discipline, and planning that are required in planning out the attack from the start to the finish, including your escape routes, though in Brevik's case, he wasn't looking for escape and personally called the police twice to come arrest him. His trial and incarceration themselves were part of his plan that took into account the Norwegian judicial and prison systems. Finally, no less important is knowing where to strike the enemy so that if worst comes to worst, the sacrifice made by the wolf is not wasted on someone or something purely symbolic and ultimately meaningless to the system's stability and ultimate survival. In the words of James Mason, quote, I don't mind paying the price, but by God, I demand the price be worth paying. Um, that ends that sub-chapter, sub but... I am parched. Excuse me for a second. Why revolution is the only way. So what approach works in this day and age if all the above-mentioned ones, save for the lone wolf approach and appropriate use of marches, are useless or even counterproductive? The answer is simple. Revolution. We started this segment of the manual talking about how we are presented certain openings for different methods and tactics, but as time marches on, those openings close and we have to move on and grasp the next opening available to us. Well, at this point, we are so far down the rabbit hole that we are only getting out by violent means. After all, violence is always the last resort. However, even here we may take too long, and then we will be forced not only to be violent, but wildly destructive. The longer the poison circulates and the further the disease progresses, the more flesh we'll ultimately have to cut to preserve what is truly vital to the survival of, of the race. Blood. When the chips are down and we are faced with literal extinction, it will mean that we are free to do absolutely anything, but most don't realize what this truly means, and likewise, most will be uncomfortable with the idea. The blood is what is truly important, as it is the seat of everything we hold dear. It is the physical embodiment of our spirit, the carrier of our psychological and physical attributes. It is source of our culture, our will, our place in the world, and it is the only thing that holds it in it the potential for rebuilding, rebuilding it all from the ground up if it comes to that. We will have, for a limited time, an opportunity to take back our societies by force, and while we have already entered a time when the promise of minimal casualties is no longer feasible, we still have the chance to preserve the legacy of what our race has accomplished up until now the artwork, the monuments, the music and lore of our ancestors, the material footprint of the race's mighty spirit. However, once that window closes and we are cornered even more than before by the enemy, we will, we will be inevitably forced to go down the path of wild abandon in order to survive, meaning that the blood, the source of that legacy, will become top priority, to such a point when the material legacy will be deemed expendable. If in order to preserve the blood we must destroy great national monuments, so be it. That is the ultimate final option we are approaching after which there is only extinction, and when that happens, even if the material footprint is allowed to stand by our triumphant enemy, it will be nothing more than a gravestone to our race. Buildings and monuments devoid of the spirit in which they were built, music and artwork rendered useless without the only blood that it could speak to in a meaningful way. Hence why blood will be the last thing we'll have left to defend, making everything else fair play. Would you rather that Greek fascists destroy the Acropolis of Athens if it meant the survival of pure-blood Greeks, whose blood can produce new monuments of such magnitude? Or will you make more excuses of respectability, presentability, playing by the system's rules, until such a point when all the Greeks are dead, Greece becomes the home of foreign immigrants, and all that is left of Greeks is but stone pillars? We are not materialists. We value the legacy of our ancestors because it speaks to our blood. But if blood itself will become truly endangered, then that legacy does become merely stone. And then we are free to destroy it. If you find that disagreeable, then I suggest you quit your delusions now and dedicate yourself fully to the revolutionary struggle now. Right now. Not tomorrow. 
not at the start of next week, on your next birthday, or as part of some New Year resolution, or on some symbolic date. Join the struggle right now. Lest you live to witness for yourself how your national treasures will become dispensable for the sake of the survival of the race. Each time we miss an opportunity presented to us by fate, we are punished with having to pay a bigger price and face tougher challenges and choices when the next opportunity comes along. Racial extinction is the end of the line. Let this sink in nice and clear. We are at war with this society. This is something that was said by James Mason in Siege decades ago, and it was as true then as it is now. In fact, it is more true now than before, because had anyone truly listened to Mason and followed what he had laid out in Siege, instead of fumbling around and stepping on the same rake time and again, we would be on our way to active revolt in our time, rather than talking about the necessity of preparing for it. The necessity that, the necessity that was already made evident for us long ago. All these other approaches are comfortable lies and means of playing pretend. They amount to nothing more than procrastination while we are losing our footing and the sky is all but ready to crash on top of us. This is war. Revolution is the only way. At this point, we are only left a choice of how destructive it will be towards our own racial legacy. Take a swig. And in this war, we have nobody but ourselves to rely on. The true fanatics for the cause who understand the difference between us and the enemy, the full scope of what we're facing, in other words, those who are or have the potential for mental liberation from the system conditioning, and that can't be the wide masses. As we said before, their awakening comes with our victory, but otherwise you can't put your hope into them. They are lemmings. They will flip-flop on you the second you let them go back into the system and the old conditioning kicks in. Sure, the average person can be a bystanding supporter, but nothing more than that, because while he nods and agrees with you, he, is, he still has stakes in the system, and at the end of the day, will go back to his slave job to earn slave respect and to fit in the system to assure his own immediate...